let's talk about the business case for sustainability. Is there a business case? Yes, but perhaps a better question would be the one asked by industrialist Ray Anderson, who said, what's the business case for ending life on Earth? Sustainability is not only about the plight of the polar bear. Indeed, it really ought to be about business. Because business is waking up to the fact that there is a very strong business case for sustainability. Whether it be reports in Harvard Business Review, my friend Yvonne Chouinard getting the cover of Fortune magazine, or the evil empire going green. But trust me, when Walmart goes green, they're not doing this out of the goodness of their hearts. There's a business case. Harvard Business Review. Sustainability isn't the burden on the bottom line it was thought to be. It is the touchstone of all of innovation. And in the future, only companies that make sustainability a goal will achieve competitive advantage. For many years, it was thought that you could care about the environment or you could care about business, but you couldn't care about both because they were in conflict. I helped write a book, Natural Capitalism, that argued that it's better business to behave responsibly to people and planet. And around 2005, I started seeing reports from the likes of these organizations showing why it was better business to behave responsibly. And so we compiled a document, Sustainability Pays, which you can download from Natural Capitalism for free, that collects about 40 of these studies. There are now hundreds of them saying essentially the same thing. So Boston Consulting Group, most companies are looking forward to a world where sustainability is mainstream, if not a required part of business strategy. Accenture, 93% of CEOs agree that it will be critical to the future success of their companies, fully embedded within 10 years. Now this was in 2010. It's now 2021. Is it fully embedded? Well, not quite. And here's why, or one of the reasons why. When McKinsey interviewed a lot of executives, they generally said this is important, but only 30% of them said that they were investing in it because they didn't know what to do. This, this is a gap. We need to fill it. The companies that are on the Dow Jones Sustainability Index outperform the general market. Goldman, <laughs> that organization of wild-eyed environmentalists, said that the companies that are the leaders in environment, social, good governance policy, considered ESG, environment, social, and governance, outperform competitors in stock performance by an average of 25%. Areas that protect their environment economically outperform regions that don't. Another Accenture report, 97% of business leaders consider it important to their future success. They see brand, trust, reputation as one of the driving factors. Economist Intelligence Unit, the companies that paid more attention to sustainability had better pro annual profit increases. And conversely, the worst performing companies were those that said they, we don't have anybody in charge of sustainability. Green winners in 16 out of 18 industries, the businesses deemed sustainability focused outperformed their peers. 
And companies issuing sustainability reports are coming up like mushrooms after a rainstorm. It's a who's who of the corporate world. It almost now is table stakes. It's the ante to get into the poker game. You, you have to have a sustainability report. You, you have to say that you have somebody paying attention to it. Ray Anderson, again, said there is no more strategic issue for a company or any organization than its ultimate purpose. If you think business exists to make a profit, think again. Business makes a profit to exist. It must exist for a higher, nobler purpose. Ray committed his company, Interface Carpets, to mission zero. Zero footprint, zero negative impacts, zero fossil fuel use, zero waste. And in the, in the mid-teens, these were his metrics. Greenhouse gas emissions down 82% in absolute tonnage, not relative to how much product he was selling. Fossil fuel use down, water use down. Profits up, sales up, costs down. Ray was one of the first industrialists to begin to prove the business case for sustainability. Here are their 2019 metrics. 89% renewable energy, 96% lower greenhouse gas emissions. Are they perfect? No. Are they seriously committed to implementing sustainability across all of their activities? You bet. And they're the first to tell you this is their competitive advantage. Ray also stumbled into an incredible insight. He realized that what he was doing to implement more sustainable practices enhanced every aspect of shareholder value. And I was sitting with Ray when he had just realized this and he was astounded. He said, that's not why I'm doing it. I'm doing it because it's the right thing to do, but it's, it's great for my shareholders. And he and I started talking, what constitutes shareholder value? Ray tracked us into this concept of the integrated bottom line. You may have heard the phrase, the triple bottom line, people, planet, profit. It was introduced by a man named John Alkington and when he brought it into the conversation, it was a great contribution, but mm, come on, business is not gonna keep three sets of books. There is a bottom line in business. And what Ray showed was when you implement more sustainable practices, you cut your costs. This goes straight to the bottom line. You also cut your risks. This may preserve what's called the franchise to operate, the, uh, the belief on the part of the public that you're a good corporate citizen. It certainly cuts your legal liabilities. It enables you to attract and retain the best talent. And in today's world, talent is everything. Once you have that talent, it enables you to drive innovation. If you set what Jim Collins calls a BHAG, a big, hairy, audacious goal, this drives innovation. Productivity, considered the holy grail of economists, when you're implementing more sustainable practices, your workforce is more productive. They're also healthier. They're also happier. They're more engaged. All of this enables you to get bigger market share, enhanced brand equity. It allows you to differentiate your product line and better manage your supply chain and have better relationships with all of your stakeholders, particularly government, 
and the nonprofit organizations that might otherwise criticize you. It reduces the cost of distrust. When Walmart announced its green initiatives, it cut in half the number of people saying, I will never shop at a Walmart. All of this constitutes shareholder value. And the companies who get it right will be first to the future. These are the billionaires of the future. Now here's the conventional triple bottom line, the three-legged stool, economics, environment, equity, or people, planet, profit, or three, the three Ps. A man named Bob Willard, who had been at IBM and became a sustainability consultant, said, when you pay attention to all three of these, here are the advantages. And he put some real numbers based on corporate examples of seven of what we've counted the 13 aspects of an integrated bottom line. You add them up and you have an increase in profitability of 38%. And these, by the way, are mid-level numbers. They're, they're not what the best companies have achieved, they're certainly not what the worst companies have achieved. They're reasonable estimates of the increase in shareholder value of implementing more sustainable practices. We took a crack at sketching a, an example of what a balance sheet might be because the way we keep accounts now misses all of this. Do you have more money? Good. Your, your assets have grown, but people, you're hiring more people, that's a liability, that's, a, that's on the cost side of the business. Really? I think that's a bad way of doing accounting. So what if you were able to count on your balance sheet, the increase in profitability from attracting and retaining the best talent and increasing their employee engagement and increasing their productivity what if you were able to count the cost of, or the savings from not having as many risks? These are all part of an integrated bottom line. Let's look at some examples. Most of us spend most of our time inside of buildings. The built environment is, is a huge part of the business world. If you have good green buildings, you will get lower employee absenteeism and higher employee productivity. University of California put some numbers to these, almost 60 billion that you don't lose to sick days, another 200 billion that you gain in increased productivity. How do you make a building green? This outfit in, uh, in Florida <laughs> employed some rocket technology, a caulk gun. Caulked the little cracks that made the building less comfortable in the summer where it was hot. They wound up saving almost $8,000 every year and their employees were happier. We know what increases productivity. Good lighting, being able to see. Soundproofing, being able to hear yourself think. The human eye evolved on the savannas of Africa. We're attuned to daylighting, and yet we lock ourselves in little cubicles with incandescent lighting that flickers, and we wonder why we're miserable. Giving employees the ability to control the heat or cool in their own working space. Air quality. Indoor air quality is typically several times worse than the outdoor air quality that we claim to regulate. CO2 concentration. When you exhale, you're blowing out CO2. So you sit in a, in a badly ventilated building, CO2 concentrations can get up to a thousand parts per million within that building when your brain 
Is getting less oxygen, more CO2? You don't think as well. People say, I don't pay much for energy. Why should I improve the energy efficiency of my buildings? What I pay a lot of money for is my people. Yeah, well, fixing up the energy performance of your building is what gives you the increase in productivity in your people. It's absolutely worth doing. And when you implement energy efficiency in a community, you generate over $2 million in increased economic activity, over half a million dollars in increased wages, and 10 times the number of jobs that you would get if you invested in central station coal-fired plants or gas plants. It's just better business. It's also what your customers want. Ogilvy, the big PR firm, surveyed customer desires. They said about 16% of the customer population are what, are what they called super greens. They will buy green regardless. About 33%, about a third, are upper middle greens. They, they really want green. There's another third that is lower middle greens. So two thirds of your customer base, all things equal, would prefer a product that is responsible to the environment. Only about 18% of the population say, nope, green is socialist. It's, it's un-American, I don't want it. Targeting these green customers is a market opportunity. Cone Communications surveyed half, com well, surveyed uh, companies in half the world's population. 93% of consumers say companies should go beyond whatever the law requires them to do, that they should operate responsibly, and that they should evolve their business practices to make their impact as positive as possible. This desire is not an American phenomenon. It's not a British phenomenon. It is the world around. This is what people want. Conversely, if they believe your company is unsustainable, it's irresponsible, 91% say they'd consider switching companies, 85% they, they'll pass that on to people they know. Some people say they won't invest in your company. 80% say they'd refuse to work there. Three quarters say they'll boycott your products. Cone again, 91% of global customers expect companies to address the serious problems facing humanity, not just make a profit. These numbers hold true year after year after year. Havas Media, 70% of people surveyed said they wouldn't care if a brand went away. Now, if you're a brand, this had better concern you. Again, sustainability isn't the burden on the bottom line. And only companies that have it as a goal will achieve competitive advantage. Now, I mentioned people. Where do people fall on your balance sheet? Companies all say our people are our biggest asset. No, they're not. On that company's balance sheet, they are listed as a liability. And so frequently companies treat their people as a liability. This has a cost. Having to replace an employee can cost you up to 200%, twice that employee's annual salary. And engaged organizations have almost four times the earnings per share growth rate of organizations with lower engagement, even in the same industry. Engaging your workers by enabling them to implement more sustainable practices as part of their day job 
is a great way to get that increased productivity and increased customer satisfaction and keep your workforce with you. Fortune found that companies that can authentically talk about their sustainability attributes have an edge in attracting young people. Young people overwhelmingly want companies to behave responsibly. They have faith in brands' ability to change the world and they want to be a part of it. They want you to ask them, how can we be a better company? And 92% of young professionals would prefer to work at an environmentally friendly company. Johnson Controls, 96% of workers 18 to 35 want to work for a responsible company. Gallup Healthways every year surveys workers in the United States and indeed around the world. They find that Americans in general don't like their jobs, but they want to like where they work. They want to be engaged. When you have an engaged workforce, Gallup found, 41% lower absenteeism, 58% fewer accidents, 20% higher sales, 21% higher profitability. This is not about polar bears. This is about the profitability of your company. Gallup found 45% of employees start searching for a new job when the economy recovers. Is this your workforce? You might wanna think about engaging them. And again, the best way to get an engaged workforce is to enable them to be implementing more sustainable practices as part of their day job. We're talking about purpose. All of us want to feel that our lives have meaning. It's really a question of, is your company on the road to becoming irrelevant or are you a leader? Ray Anderson tragically died in 2011. And a newspaper reached out to me and said, who is the next Ray Anderson? And I said, Paul Pullman. Paul at the time had just been hired as the CEO at Unilever. Within a week of being hired, he said, we're not going to report quarterly. I mean, companies in theory have to report every quarter the growth in their profits. Paul said, this is wrong. I'm not going to build a great company by trying to grow profits every quarter, quarter on quarter on quarter. I need to invest in our people, in transforming how we do business to become more sustainable. And if we do this, the shareholder will be rewarded. Paul said, winning alone is not enough. We have to win with purpose. Unilever announced the sustainable living plan, cut their environmental impacts in half while still growing. Source 100% of everything that they buy, all of their supply chain that comes from agriculture sustainably and improve the livelihoods of more than a billion people. This is a big, hairy, audacious goal. This is a BHAG. Unilever did very well. They implemented a lot of sustainability. And in 2017, the Raiders noticed. Warren Buffett and 3G, which had just bought Kraft Heinz, came raiding. They said, we want to buy Unilever. And Buffett said, this is a friendly offer for a lot of money, $143 billion. Took Paul just about all of 24 hours to say, nope. 
because he looked at what 3G had done to Kraft Heinz. They'd stripped out the sustainability program. They had basically raided the company in order to increase their profits, their short-term profits. Many of us were very concerned that Unilever would do what it would do to itself, what 3G had done to Kraft Heinz, that they would cut any program that didn't immediately drive growth. Because the Unilever shareholders said, you're turning down this great offer? We could make a lot of money. Paul said, I will help you make a lot more money by doubling down on sustainability. And he rolled out these statistics that customers want sustainability. And the fact that Unilever's purpose-driven brands, the brands that were most embedding sustainability, 17 brands out of Unilever's 300 brands grew the fastest and delivered most of the profitability. This is what a company is made of. The management fundamentals, the leadership, and the sustainable systems. Freya Williams, say uh, a marketing executive, was at Edelman, then took over as head of Futera North America, wrote this book, Green Giants, profiling nine companies that went from startup to over a billion dollars. And she identified these qualities of a company that is going to succeed in today's world. They have a courageous leader, someone who's willing to stand out. They implement disruptive innovation. They have this higher purpose. Sustainability is built in, not bolted on. They reach mainstream appeal. They're not weird and crazy. And they walk the talk. If you come looking in a world of internet transparency, they're the same inside as they're saying they are outside. Here's the sort of thing that great companies do. This is the Google parking lot. Those are solar panels. One, you park in the shade in California, that is nice. But two, you have pull down plugins for your plug-in hybrid or your EV. Google committed to what it called RE less than C, renewable energy costing less than coal. And this was back around 2010 or so, 2009. Coal was the cheap form of electricity. Google said, we're going to change that. That caught the eye of General Electric. GE said, wait a minute. We're the engineering company. Google's an advertising company. And so GE started to change. And a friend of mine wrote me and said, we've done it. We've done RE less than C. Our wind turbines now deliver electricity cheaper than coal. We're doing it and we're going to move into solar. GE, classic company. It was on the Dow Jones when the Dow Jones was first invented. Its iconic CEO was Jack Welch, known as Hatchet Jack. He made stock go up by firing people, hence the name Hatchet Jack. And he implemented programs like Six Sigma to eliminate variation from a norm. But when you do that throughout an entire company, you also compromise their innovation. When Jack Welch retired and Jeff Immelt succeeded him, Immelt said, we need innovation. And so he committed to a program called Ecomagination in 2005. 
He announced it at a big press conference with the head of World Resources Institute, Jonathan Lash, standing beside him. They committed to spend a billion and a half a year on research to show how to cut their greenhouse gas emissions and how to deliver products to their customers that were dramatically more efficient. Imelt said, we can help improve the environment and make money doing it. Now, a lot of the environmentalists jumped up and down and said, greenwashing, greenwashing. All he did was badge as green products he was already making. Yeah, greenwashing. But in many ways, hypocrisy is the first step to real change. By 2010, <clears throat> Excuse me, 2007, Ecomagination products had doubled. They were doubling again. Imelt said, we're going to blow away our original projections. They had pledged to cut their greenhouse gas emissions 1% by 2012. They cut them 4% in 2006. By 2010, the revenues were 25 billion in a letter to shareholders, Imelt said, if Ecomagination were a separate company, it would be Fortune 130. Ecomagination was driving General Electric's success. The 80 product lines were incredibly profitable. And then they hit a roadblock. If you look at the stock, GE hit an all-time high under Jack Welch. It's one of the reasons he's considered one of the world's great CEOs. But again, he did it by cutting people. And notice, under his tenure, stocks had started to decline. Imelt comes on, and he's still in the midst of a decline. Ecomagination turns it around. 2008, the financial collapse, it just about everybody got hammered. But ML was building it back up again until it started to slide. What happened? What happened was ML couldn't bring himself to wholly believe in Ecomagination. He had bought the company Alstom, which makes coal turbines. And he said, fossil fuels are still going to have a place. We're going we're gonna to back Alstom. Had a company called Baker Hughes, does oil field services. As the renewable revolution took hold, those two companies started to slide. And around 2016, GE diverged from the S&P. Standard and Poor's and started to fall and kept falling and fell some more. So again, Imelt had inherited some bad practices from Jack Welch, but Imelt doubled down on fossil. 2018, GE was kicked off the Dow Jones to the point where they, uh, they had to sell their light bulb division Stocks continued to fall. Imelt retired. He was too proud to let go of Alstom. They brought in a guy, John Flannery. He's retired. GE is now in a rebuilding mode. It matters who your leader is. And it matters what your vision is. It matters what your purpose is. Hypocrisy is the first step to real change but it can also be the end of your company if you don't walk the talk. Who said this? There can't be anything good about putting all those chemicals in the air, about the smog you see in cities, about putting chemicals in these rivers in third world countries so somebody can buy an item for less money here. These things are just inherently wrong whether you're an environmentalist or not. Is this Greta Thunberg? Is, is this the head of uh, Greenpeace? This was the CEO of Walmart. 
who about 2005 realized that Walmart had to make a change. And under Lee Scott's leadership, Walmart pledged to become 100% renewably powered, zero waste, carbon neutral, and sell only sustainable products. Why? Because they realized this would save them money. They've become the world's largest organic retailer. Before Lee Scott, Walmart's stock was falling. It had done very well in the 90s. They had all these big box retail stores. They used a lot of electricity and they had a lot of critics. So under Scott's leadership, they did things like this. What's the difference between the picture on top and the picture on the bottom? Doors. They put doors on the refrigerator cabinets. Why? Because it saves money, saves electricity. They did another thing. They put LED lights inside and they put motion detectors. So if nobody is in front of the cabinet, the lights go off. What they hadn't realized is the kids loved it. They'd run up to the counter to see the lights go blink. Where the kids are, the parents are, Walmart sells more stuff. Again, trust me, they're not doing this out of the goodness of their hearts. They are saving money at every step. But here's some of the things they did. They built the Walmart sustainability scorecard. Question number one, have you measured your corporate greenhouse gases? Question number two, are you reporting to the CDP, the Carbon Disclosure Project. Walmart suppliers who were given this questionnaire said, the who? And this is what made Carbon Disclosure Project the information powerhouse that it is today. The 100 plus, 100 plus thousand Walmart suppliers all had to start reporting to CDP. Walmart's goal was to drive sustainability four layers deep into the supply chain. And then they asked questions around solid waste and around water use, around the impact of their suppliers on communities. And again, the suppliers' suppliers, where are you getting the stuff to make the stuff that you sell to us? Is Walmart a sustainable company? No. But this sustainability scorecard and all of Walmart's other initiatives have probably done more to drive sustainability throughout the economy than anything I'll ever do. We worked with this little company, Mirancho Tortillas. They make um, tortillas. They had no earthly interest in sustainability, but they wanted to sell to Walmart. So they called us up and said, can you help us meet this sustainability scorecard? Sure. So we came in and helped Mirancho switch out light bulbs to more efficient ones, get more efficient ovens to cook the tortillas. That, by the way, made uh, working conditions better for their people. The first year, Mirancho spent $14,000, they saved $32,000. With all of their waste elimination, they reckoned they were gonna save about a half a billion dollars. This is getting to be real money for a little company. This is what the Walmart sustainability scorecard has done across the economy. This is Walmart's uh, plan when they rolled this out. They get into sustainability. Lee Scott made his speech. They launched the scorecard. They hosted seminars for their suppliers. They added these questions to how they rank, how they rate the performance of their buyers. Previously, buyers were only ranked on could get, they get the lowest price item. When they started being ranked on, are you getting the most sustainable item? The buyers shifted how they were doing business. Walmart in 2020 pledged to become a regenerative company. Now they have no earthly idea what this means, 
but they're serious about figuring it out. And again, when big companies like this take on these big, hairy, audacious goals, they can drive the world. In a way, this is a follow-on from Sam Walton, who was a hell of an entrepreneur, who said, incrementalism is innovation's worst enemy. We don't want continuous improvement. We want radical change. These principles that we outlined in the book, Natural Capitalism, are core to what all of these companies are doing. You buy time by pushing off problems like the climate crisis, the other environmental crises, by dramatically increasing resource productivity. Why? Because it cuts your costs. And it gives you a cash flow to begin to more fundamentally redesign how you make and deliver all of your products and services using approaches like biomimicry, the circular economy, zero waste, zero toxicity. And finally, you manage to regenerate human and natural capital, as well as manufactured and financial capital. You seek to improve all forms of capital to have the, the wealth to be able to create more wealth. This is the heart of capitalism. This is just better business. Bucky said the best way to predict the future is to invent it. This is what the leading companies are doing. We're going to have to reinvent everything as my colleague Catherine Greener puts it, all institutions, we're gonna to have to reinvent the way we do business in order to create an economy and service to life. 